is the jet age. Jet transportation is the fastest the world has ever known for passengers, mail, and cargo. Fleets of giant commercial jetliners wing their way between cities, across continents, and oceans. Partners in the dynamic industry of aviation are the communities which provide the airports. The Port of Oakland has pioneered in airport development since 1927. Aviation grew, and Oakland kept pace with the industry step by step. As aviation advanced to the jet age, airports required larger land areas. Oakland's waterfront site was uniquely ideal. The Board of Port Commissioners adopted a bold plan for expansion to fill in the shallow waters of San Francisco Bay and create new land extending more than a mile out from shore. High-grade sand deposits are found in the bay bottom to the west of the airport. First, clamshell dredges scoop mud, shells, and gravel to build a dike. When it rises above the water, the gigantic filling begins behind this barrier. The huge hydraulic dredge Franciscan pumps 15 million cubic yards of sand through 30-inch dredge lines. The sand travels through these lines for distances up to five miles. Pumping goes on around the clock. As the heavier sand settles out of the water, islands of fill begin to appear. Construction of the dike goes on until it is 12 feet above the surface of the water. It is more than four and a half miles around. As it drains and dries, the new airport site appears to be a desert in the bay. Water in the unfilled areas is being pumped out from new pumping stations. Heavy equipment ventures into the desert-like site to begin grading and compacting. The sand, which will produce 600 acres of new land, is excellent fill material because it settles and compacts uniformly. Three months are spent blading and rolling to achieve compaction. With the sand in place, the rock base for the pavement is hauled in by barges for the runways, taxiways, and parking aprons, which must support jet aircraft weighing up to a quarter of a million pounds. A conveyor hauls the rock over the dike to a hopper. The trucks are loaded swiftly. Trucks running from the conveyor to placement sites must travel as much as five miles each way. A network of roads and runways begins to emerge in the sand. A site is prepared for the new passenger terminal. Plans are drawn by architects Warnicke and Warnicke. In consultation with the Federal Aviation Agency, the port staff and commissioners, the commercial airlines and consultants. In this model, we see the plan, a long curved building for the airline ticket counters, a two-story lobby with a spectacular 11-story control tower rising from its core, and a finger with 10 gate loading positions. On October 5, 1960, a groundbreaking ceremony representative of the size of the project is held. Because the fill for the airport is sand 14 feet deep, overlaying a layer of soft mud, piles must be driven to support the building. Huge mandrels are used to drive corrugated casings into the ground.
These are fitted together to the required length. Many are driven 50 feet or more to reach firm bearing material. Mandrels are withdrawn after the casing is driven. Then the casing is filled with concrete, reinforced with steel to form the concrete pile. More than 1,200 piles are needed for the terminal complex. With terminal construction underway, utilities are brought into the site. Water lines are left exposed until after they can be tested under pressure. Thousands of feet of electrical conduit are brought to the terminal along the connecting taxiway to provide power for the building and for the electronic navigation aids of the Federal Aviation Agency. But for a major portion of the field lighting, Waterproof wires are buried directly in the sand and conduits are used only under the paved areas. The terminal begins to take form and shape. A network of steel reinforcing is prepared for the concrete subfloor. On the field, the rock base is bladed, watered, and rolled to a uniform thickness of eight inches over the nine miles of the new runway, taxiways, high-speed turnoffs, and aprons. This pattern is clear as we fly over the runway after an oil seal coat has been placed before the final paving with asphaltic concrete. Paving for the jets is a precision task. Asphaltic concrete is spread in two layers, each an inch and a half thick, producing a three inch thick pavement. Tolerances of only one quarter of an inch in 16 feet are allowed for jet smoothness. Concrete paving is used instead of asphaltic concrete at points of stress on the field. The parking aprons and holding pads where the jet blast is greatest. This concrete is more than a foot thick to withstand the corrosive blast of the jets. A concrete batching plant is set up on the site. Concrete is mixed here transported in trucks, loaded by hopper, mixed in a dual paper for approximately 30 seconds, transferred to a second for further mixing, then to a hopper and dumped in front of the spreader. Behind this comes the mechanical finisher. Vibrators screed off the surface until smooth. Irregularities are leveled out by a bull float. Followed by a burlap drag, which gives the concrete a slightly rough texture so that it is not too slippery. After the spreading operation, 
Machinery inserts expansion joints in the concrete slab to control cracking. Then the concrete is covered with a waxy coating to maintain its moisture content. As it dries, it is carefully checked for surface irregularities which must be eliminated. Now the spectacular architecture of the terminal building is forming. The complex of buildings includes a separate structure for emergency vehicles and mechanical equipment for air conditioning and heating. Now clearly defined are the 500-foot curved ticketing and baggage handling buildings, the two-story lobby and its control tower, and the loading gates. Roofs of the ticketing building and lobby are built of lightweight pre-cast concrete shells. Forms were built on the site for ticketing building conoids and the square-shaped hyperbolic paraboloids for the lobby. A new method of moving the precast shells was developed on the job. A gantry on four crawler tractor treads lifts the roof sections from the forms and stores them, then in turn moves them to the building site. Two mobile cranes lift them into place. They are carefully fastened to the supporting columns. Cranes also lifted the lobby roof sections into place atop their supporting columns to form the geometric pattern of the lobby roof. Drain pipes run through the supporting columns. The control tower is the first unit in the new terminal to be completed because it must be in operation before the new runway can be used. The Federal Aviation controllers from this vantage point 127 feet high control traffic on the three older runways as well as the new jet strip. Eight of the 11 floors are occupied by the Federal Aviation Agency to house the latest in communications, radar, and electronic aids to air navigation. The new runway has completely unobstructed overwater approaches. The usual landing direction has four miles over water, while on takeoff, the nearest structure is the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, nine miles away, an outstanding safety feature. The location of the runway, more than a mile out in the bay, has an additional advantage. It minimizes the noise nuisance to populated areas of the surrounding communities. These features, safety and the abatement of noise, are combined in an airport which is less than 20 minutes from Oakland's business center and the port of Oakland's prime deep water harbor and industrial development. Today, with the big jets and the huge land areas required for airports, there isn't a better site in the country, and probably very few equal to it in the world. New centerline lights and new high-speed turnoffs, banked and curved, 
to permit the largest jets to leave the runway at 60 miles an hour, increase runway capacity and safety night and day. This massive expansion and improvement program, with its great land reclamation, represents an investment of $20 million. $10 million voted by the people of Oakland, more than $7 million in federal aid, and $3 million in funds from the Port of Oakland to meet the requirements of Jet Age Commerce. The new $5,200,000 terminal complex presents a facility designed for passenger comfort and convenience, as well as operational efficiency. Passengers arrive at the curved, glass-fronted ticketing building, with its canopy extending over the sidewalk and parking lane for weather protection. Doors opening automatically are in front of each airline counter. On the eighth floor of the tower is the cocktail lounge, with a magnificent panoramic view of the bay, its cities, and airport operations. The second floor restaurant of the lobby building overlooks the aircraft loading ramps. There are spacious indoor and outdoor observation decks, and 24 clocks tell the time in each of the world's time zones. Coffee shop, gift shop, barber shop, and nursery offer more passenger conveniences. The terminal is completely air-conditioned from the ticketing building to the aircraft loading gates. All units were designed for independent future expansion. Initially designed to accommodate 800,000 passengers a year, this building complex may be expanded to more than triple its size. The single finger may be expanded to four to provide 40 gate loading positions. The new terminal and runway complex provide the commercial airlines and their passengers with the latest in modern facilities. The facilities are connected by taxiway and roadway to the previously existing airport which more and more will be used by private and corporate aircraft and the many planes brought to Oakland for maintenance and overhaul in the modern shops and hangars, which make a major contribution to the economy of the area. Buildings range from a huge cantilevered hangar for the largest jet airliners to small tea hangars for light planes. Metropolitan Oakland International Airport is an airport for the jet age.